right now and i believe yes we are live You're so here. <laughs> hello everybody at the moment nobody here yet but uh those of you who are watching the recorded version you can watch from the very beginning so hello everybody this is uh nina again in a live interview with one of the teachers from our team and this time with my dear dear friend Lenka Ludvikova. Hello, Lenka. Hi, Ninoj, and hi, everybody else. Hi, I am so happy that you um, accepted my invitation uh, because this, as last time with Petya Pekete, this is your first time doing a Facebook Live. So yeah, congratulations. Really I'm a virgin, <laughs> a streaming virgin. A streaming virgin. So, as we My always favorite. say, you always have to try, and yeah. um, and we should lead by the example um, mm -hmm. for our students. I'm definitely. That's why you're doing it, yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely leaving my comfort zone. I've left it when I agreed to to this um, con interview or whatever that is. So yes, definitely out there in the wilderness. But as I said, when I was, I was not pushing you, I hope too much, but when I was right. kind of trying to convince you to do this, because I believe that uh those uh watching uh will highly benefit from this interview i said but lenny you are so used to doing conferences is it different is it a different feeling it is different because i can't see my audience here and i don't have the immediate feedback. so and I'm we have seven people <laughs> so, how do you know we've got seven Eight. I can see it here. Eight, eight people. Yes. So uh, those of you watching, can you say where you are watching from? So we have an idea. We don't feel so anonymous. Nine, nine people watching now. Amazing. So <laughs> where are you watching? Where are you watching? Please write in the comments um, mm -hmm. so that we feel like uh, you are here with us. Yeah. It, it I does feel strange, but you can get used to it. I just, I got used to it okay. throughout the months and um, I kind of love it. I love the interaction because hopefully people are going to uh, write something here, questions for you and okay. so on. <laughs> we'll see how active they are. Well, it's, it's very different from the conference actually, because I sit, I'm actually sitting in my living room which is very different and uh, the fact that i'm you know just in my socks and not dressed <laughs> up or something uh makes a big big difference to, to it's to... comfy yeah but kind of strange comfy <laughs> yes <laughs> out of your comfort zone in the comfort yeah. of your home yeah. <laughs> oh my god we have 13 people at the moment this is a record for uh 14 oh wow please tell okay. us where you are guys we want to know who is watching and where uh, where are you and who is watching who else is watching from their living room <laughs> yes <laughs> or kitchen i'm in my kitchen oh. as you can see Oh, great. Uh, Carlos, Carlos Hernando. I met him on, uh, sorry, YouTube. I remember you, Carlos. Lada, hello from Brno. Uh, yes, wonderful. Colombia, yes, Carlos is from Colombia. So you even see the names of the people. Wow, that's cool. Now I can see it. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, Lenny, let's get into it. Uh, right. You are uh, what I called, and one of your friends made fun of today, um, a senior teacher on my team. And by senior, yeah. I mean um, an expert, of course, not with age, <laughs> because we are still so young. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right. We are the same. We are the same age, actually, uh -oh. and uh, we are um, very good friends as well in uh, our in our personal lives, but also colleagues. So, how about you first introduce yourself? Uh, what do you do? What is your profession? 
Well, I, I, the, the, the immediate answer that comes to my mind is I teach, but actually I don't like the word teach and teaching because I don't consider myself to be the teacher who would come and give a lecture or who would explain things. I prefer to use uh, the word I, I lead or I guide my students through their learning because learning is much more important than my teaching so um, I don't like to call myself a teacher actually but it's the, it's the easiest way to call myself so I'm a teacher I've been teaching for a very long time and I teach at the moment I teach uh, at a university it's Mandel University for the second year um, in Brno, in Brno, Czech Republic, yeah. In Brno. And I teach students from different faculties, from um, different um, uh, fields of studies. And it's really interesting to meet them and to learn from them as well. Um, so I teach young learners, uh, young adults, actually. Um, young and, learners too. You teach so all learning. ages. Because, yeah, I, I even experimented with teaching kids last year after a very long time of not having done it. And uh, I also have some individual students. Um, I think some of them are watching now. Uh, so, yeah, I've got <laughs> as well. What else? Well, I taught, I've got to say that I actually uh, trained to be in the past or at my secondary school, I trained to be a um, preschool teacher or a nursery school teacher. And I never taught at a nursery school, or actually I did when I was at the university, I had a part-time job in an English kindergarten. And right. then I taught at an elementary school, I taught at secondary school, I, I taught at language schools, I taught in wow. campuses, and I, I Is there anything you haven't, anyone you haven't taught? <laughs> Well, I can't think. Maybe seniors, not yet, but I will get there eventually, I think. I, well, I tried with my uncle, actually. So, yes, I even tried, like, you know, people above 60 who try to learn a language. So, I don't know. Um, yes, teacher. I admire those teachers and I know a few teachers who specialize in uh, teaching uh, senior students and they love it. And I think it's such a beautiful thing to do uh, to to work with people who are done with their working life and they really want to focus on um, further educating themselves and traveling. Yeah, so. I think there are going to be more and more of these people actually. So yes. yeah, there's yes. definitely a market for, for that. Okay, and uh, what do you do um, at Nina English? I teach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't for, for how many years? I believe five years now. I think that we met, yeah, five, five or six years ago we met and then you know after some time i started to do some courses with you so yes it's been quite a while it's like yesterday it's like I yesterday we had that coffee better. at cafe steiner yes, yes <laughs> and uh, we planned one hour how stupid of us because we couldn't stop yep. talking and yep. we realized we are basically like twins both in personal and working life yeah so <laughs> We had all we still have in common true um, so many things the way we learned english uh we both have a daughter and uh, we both teach uh uh students to be self uh self-study learners autonomous learners so uh, we we are all about self-directed learning both of us so we yeah we work very well like that clicked immediately when we met so yeah not it was not a surprise when you suggested that you would like to invite me to the courses and i don't know i i, I can't remember how many courses uh, so many so i wonder if anybody watching here uh has uh knows lenka anybody anybody watching here knows lenka has had a lesson with lenka or knows lenka please type uh in the comments and also uh hello to the new uh 
to the newcomers, please type where you are watching from. We have uh, uh, we have somebody from Colombia, we have somebody from Brno, but I don't know where the others are. Uh, we don't know where the others are, so please type it in. And in the meantime, uh, how about we start at the beginning? How did you learn your fantastic English? Because uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard you, well, very few times that I heard you make a mistake. Very few times. Oh, all make mistakes, and it's great that we do. I'm a big fan of mistakes, of making mistakes. I love when my students make mistakes. And they always laugh at me when I say that in my class in the seminars at university when I say I love when you make mistakes but when yes. my students make a mistake or more then I feel valuable I feel like I'm needed and I need that. <laughs> that's why I teach I need to be needed um, so we can when my students make mistakes then we can learn we can all learn if my students don't make any mistakes then is there any way forward? How how could we improve? So I love when people make mistakes, and I openly admit even my own mistakes. And I think it's Same. really it's really important to show that to the students, to show that yes. yes, I make mistakes too. I'm not a native speaker, but even as a native speaker, even in Czech, in my own mother tongue, I make exactly. mistakes. So what? I just allow myself to make mistakes in English too. So I think it's more about the attitude or, yeah, probably attitude is the best word um, to the mistakes. Um, and well, English is not my first uh, foreign language. Uh -huh. I actually, my first foreign language was German. Because German, because you are from Znojmo, yes, yeah. from near, nearby the Austrian borders. And, and even, you know, back in 1980s, we could watch uh, Austrian TV, and we did. Um, dirty Dancing, I remember Dirty Dancing, knowing yeah. in German, knowing German from that movie, and Baywatch, and uh, Baywatch. Night Rider. Michael Night Rider. Night Rider. Car, yes. yes, that was that was my favorite. And the radio, I listened to the radio all the time because they played cool oh, music. Yeah, 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 it's true. And so that was my my first encounter with a uh, foreign language. Where and and then my parents said, uh, "Why don't you take classes with uh, some other kids of German?" And they found this very old professor in in Znojmo. She was. She was an Austrian who just stayed there after the war because she married a Czech guy probably or something. She was in her, I think she was 70 or 80. She was very old and she lived in this beautiful apartment. It was in a functionalist building. It was, it was beautiful. It was amazing, amazing place. And I still remember the smell of, of that apartment. And she, in the first class, it was my brother and some other kids there and myself. We were, I think we were about eight or nine. I think I was in the third or fourth grade. And, and this old professor said in the very first class, she said, you can learn Italian in three months. You can learn English in three years. You can learn French in 30 years, but you can never learn German. So that was how motivating. motivating. <laughs> and that's actually when my learning of English stopped or my motivation for English stopped immediately. I was like German, oh, German, 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 for German, German. Yeah, German. Yeah. So that was that was it basically. And I think I never got beyond it. I would I mean maybe now it's different, but back then So English, what's your English journey? Um and my English was it, it started after the Velvet Revolution, thank God for that. Uh, and my teacher of Russian, who taught me for, for one year, she taught me Russian. I had another teacher before her. Then over summer holiday, she became my English teacher. <laughs> that happened to so many of us. I know. I know. It, yeah. Do you, anybody watching, do you remember your English teacher being a former Russian teacher? Has it happened to you? Please tell us. Oh, Katja is watching. Hi, Katja. <laughs> and, and she was she was amazing because she gave me the, the the foundation. She gave me the basics of pronunciation, very good pronunciation, I think. And 
um, you know, I, I remember the first classes. I remember how we did, how we played games. And she had really some fun activities. She, she did not do just the, the, the textbook with us. So that was cool. And I had her for two years. That was the beginning of English. And then at the secondary school, I had an excellent teacher as well. And then uh, my parents uh, gave me the opportunity or, or, yeah, I had a chance actually to go to England with my cousin for two weeks. And it was back in 1993. Wow, yeah, I remember those days in, in no, London. It was magical. No and there were no mobile phones, nothing. And my parents knew nothing about me for 18 days. The journey. And took, you knew nothing about them. I knew nothing about them. And I was, I mean, I was 16 when my parents let me go to, uh, to, it was not London, it was actually Manchester or Bolton. So it's north of Manchester. And the journey there took, I think, 35 hours or so on a bus. Right. Cause just to London was 25. I did it so many times. And then to Manchester. Then get from Victoria Coast Station to Russell Square or the other way around. And then, then to um, Manchester and from Manchester to Bolton. It was like, uh, it was never, it was a never ending journey. Um, it was great experience. And uh, in those two But weeks, it was worth it. Look at you now. <laughs> because I fell in love. That's when I fell in love with English. I knew it was different than German it, from the first, from, from day one. It was actually similar to, similar to Russian. I quite liked learning Russian because I had two wonderful teachers. And then the same thing happened with English. I, I just loved it from day one. And then when I saw... <laughs> when I saw the Dover cliffs and it was horrible because yeah. we're, we were on the ferry it was a small ferry we were going from Calais to Dover in night in the middle of the night it was a one o'clock ferry connection and it was a storm it was November it was a stormy night it was a small ferry and I'm seasick so for one hour and a half or so my dear cousin just looked after me and he just could not think of you know what what to do with me he tried everything and nothing worked i was just so sick and then we knew that we still have 15 more hours uh to to get to bolton but it was amazing and it was it was really cool and that's when i actually tried not just classes not just you know english classes but we uh did lots of stuff outside of the classes so we had classes in the morning it was only four of us so it was very intense it involved writing a lot so we actually wow. it was didn't speak much when you're in england and you don't speak no. you don't use the people in the streets why we did we did in the afternoon we, we did in the afternoon the morning always started with a diary so we wrote about yeah. the previous day or about the weekend or about a journey to practice the past tense which was amazing my english was back that was basic english and the fact that i had to write about something in the past taught me how to use past tense so it's a very clever way to start the day and then we had three more hours of something intense but more or less regular quite individual as well but it was exercises and filling in and some explanations and then in the afternoons uh we did stuff around bolton in bolton lake districts liverpool blackpool wow to places spoke to people it was amazing that there was a lot of social life involved so those two weeks were and this yeah. was when you were how old 18 uh, 16. 16. Oh, wow. Wow. I was 15, actually 15 and a half. It was, it was in the second year at the secondary school, but I only the went. The best investment your parents made. Yeah. Yes. And, and they actually did it once more. So I, I did the same thing one year later. No, I think we went there in March the first time. And then in the same year, I went there in November again. So it was the second time, again, two weeks, the same journey. <laughs> and I felt the progress. 
so much. Mm -hmm. I feel like, wow, that's that's amazing. Because the second time I could actually understand, I could speak to people and yeah, it made me believe that, yeah, it works. And was this also the time when you fell in love with England? Because I know you are a big fan of the British culture. Yeah. You yeah. are always an expert here in our courses uh, mm -hmm. for the British culture. Um, yeah. For me, it's always been pop music and London. Um, and uh, yeah, just the, the 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 cosmopolitan atmosphere, the different cultures, the the markets, the the people in the bars, and the the, the lively different types of neighborhoods. Uh, but I know for you, it's also been uh, a lot about the history and the art. Yeah. Uh, the parks I love the parks and the nature and and the people I loved uh, because I, I met so many amazing people during my trails it was the the two times that my parents gave me those two weeks in Bolton and then after the third year at the secondary school when I was 17 I decided to go there on my own as an au pair for three months uh, for summer and it was 17 wow 17 yes and oh yes i can expect this from my daughter very soon look at, look at that brave girl over here yeah. <laughs> actually it was amazing i still have in a box in a pantry i still have letters that i exchanged with my parents and during those three months we exchanged i i still have those 12 letters from my mum that she sent to me because you know to make a phone call was very expensive so we wrote letters and my parents came to see me as well for a few days and i was in love with my you know first big boyfriend and so we exchanged letters as well it was it was really nice to to experience this Aww. Too. The nineties, the beginning of the nineties. This I miss was it. 1995. Yep, and I still. Actually this is when. Sorry, go on. I I uh, found a jumper, a sweatshirt that I bought for for the first money I earned as an au pair. <laughs> uh, I found the sweatshirt two weeks ago when my daughter needed to put something on. It was. <laughs> Prince wardrobe is still there. My first money when what I bought for my first money as an au pair. So Lenny, after this, you went on studying English at university because you loved the language so much and yeah. you wanted to become a teacher or what was the idea? Well, I always said I would never be a teacher. I, I never be a teacher. And, but I loved Here English. Here we are. Here we are, 15 years yeah. later. You just can't escape it when it's your destiny, like it or not, yeah. plan it or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was actually, I, I, I loved English and I wanted to become an interpreter and a translator, oh. a combination of both I thought would be you know, good for me which I later realized during my studies is not gonna be my career because when <laughs> my dad and, and my, and my parents are both teachers and they both taught Czech language and literature and they're very good at, you know, writing speeches and essays and everything else in Czech. They're very good at that. So when I did in one of my translation seminars, um, we were translating short stories of na of contemporary um, Native Americans. And uh, it was in the end, actually I have the book here. It's a, it's a collection of short stories, Vina tu tari And we did, <laughs> we did it as a student project. We were translating the short stories and uh, from English into Czech. And then before I handed it in to my teacher, I asked my dad to proofread uh, my yeah, Czech yeah. and my dad went mad. He was like, <gasps> he's like, don't what ever is have that. Not Czech. You can't do this to your mother tongue. What are you doing? Have we not taught you Czech properly? And he was really, really upset about, about me <gasps> and, and my Czech. 
that was the moment when I realized, uh oh, okay, translating is not my way. That's not what I'm going to do in my life. And um, so actually, after I finished university, I, I taught for because teaching was like it was somehow the automatic second choice for me. But I also felt like I want to try something else. Come on, I'm not going to teach from Just now. Teach, yeah. yeah. From now on until I retire. And so I um, by the way, are any te are there any teachers watching us? Please tell us if you're a teacher watching. That would be nice to see how many teachers there you are. Yeah. Your experiences and how you planned a different career, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, same as us. Yeah. So uh after um uh, some time at school i decided to take a gap year because at university i learned how to analyze shakespeare's dramas i i took two semesters of shakespeare and i had you know all the cultural studies and all those theoretical subjects and courses and i felt like okay i speak like a book but it's not real english so I took a gap year, not before university, but after university. <laughs> and uh, I lived in London for just over a year. And that's where I think most of my pronunciation comes from, because yeah. I was exposed to, yeah, to lots of different Englishes, but, but yeah, especially one that, that really had impact on on, yes, on yeah. Lenka is known for the British language teacher here. Uh -huh, <laughs> yes. okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very nice yeah. British accent. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, even so, even last time somebody asked, Oh, I can hear some something British from you. I don't know. Some people say that uh it's I, I'm not very good at accents and, and dialects. Some people say that they can hear Kiwi accent in what I say in Australian. And it's thanks to Emma. Are you there? Emma, are you watching? Thanks to uh, my friend Emma, I think. Emily, who is a Kiwi. My, she was my best friend back in London, um, together with Taja. And, and I think a lot of my English comes from her as well. Like the first time we worked together and Emma asked me, Linka, have you got a pin? <laughs> Gosh. I love you? that accent. What is that? Have you got a pin? I don't have a pin. Why would I have a pin? And she was asking for a pen, obviously, but I, I had no idea. I did not understand her at all. But then I got used to it, like everything else. It's it's. I think it only takes time and patience and then it works. So anyways, back to your teaching, if we may. Yes. yes. Well, um, after, after that year in, actually after that year in, uh, in London, when I did lots of things, uh, I worked for a catering company. I worked as a waitress, as a receptionist and lots of other things. I decided to work for Longman Pearson Education and I stayed there for two years. And I was a sales representative for the Czech Republic. So I was actually uh, in charge of selling textbooks, which is apparent. Ah. Ah. So and now we, today we are supposed to be talking about no textbook. So let's get into it. Yeah. Also, the reason I think why I'm not keen on textbooks, because I see the, the business behind it. So exactly. One That's of, my one of my reasons too. It's a big business. It is. It is. It, 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 it Pub is publishing big. publishing houses, the four biggest publishing houses. It's a big business, and um, I'm not happy with it at all. That's why I teach without course books. Mm -hmm. I believe that they are not really helping people to improve their uh, spoken English, especially, and that is the the most important thing that we all need and uh they are just uh, they they keep uh publishing um uh, newly edited versions fit the version of this and that and people behind it just make a lot of money 
Yes, so, do. Yeah, well, and the schools fine. are constantly, um, uh, constantly uh, get new books. Yeah, they have to buy yeah. new books. And yeah. So I really believe what we are doing here without course books. Uh, and let's get to that topic now. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, that it, it is really helpful. We see the results, and um, and. It, it, this whole money machine behind it is just not part, a part of it. And I'm quite mm. rebellious like that, I guess. <laughs> I think that I'm a rebel at, at this too, even at university. Uh, but at the same time, maybe not. Because I've never seen a teacher who would be an advocate of a textbook, who would say, wow, this is a perfect textbook. And we are going to, I, I teach this because it's perfect. I think that all of us have got some reservations, some objections and some criticism. So we, from time to time, even when we teach from textbooks, when anybody teaches from textbooks, they bring materials outside of the textbooks. I yes. just, when I started doing this, I realized that it's much better to use the other materials than the textbooks themselves. So. For and me, what do you think of the dogma Yelty no material approach? Yeah, I do it sometimes. Very, actually. Very often. We do it very often here, yeah? Yeah, it's because then what we get from the students and what we give to the students is what exactly what they need, what they ask for, what is relevant for them. So then it it's going to work for me. I think that uh, it's the most beneficial way to, to give the students what they need, what they want. And Dogme is actually about getting exactly this from the students, so. Focusing on the students' needs. That's where I, that's yep. where I got it from. Uh, that's uh, what, what inspired me the most at the beginning of uh, the, 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 the time the, when I started the courses without course books, mm -hmm. uh, that you, you really focus on the person in front of you. And uh, that's like in real life. There is no textbook in yeah. between the two people when they're having a conversation in a bar or at an airport or reception desk or yeah. in a restaurant. Uh, yeah, Carlos no uh, notes, uh, uh, traditional schools are attached to textbooks, yes. And uh, here we are a very innovative school, I would say, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, and whatever you, else you do in your other projects is very innovative as well. So it's all up to us, the teachers. I would really like to um, uh, encourage and inspire the, especially the freelance teachers who are not so dependent on um, on their employer to to yeah. try it out to go mm -hmm. and just speak to your students from your heart right but but even in the system I think you do have um, the right and the possibility the chance to to bring something extra and you don't have to you know attach to the textbook why I'm why so glad you're saying that. It's, it's, I know that sometimes it's the parents who want that. And it's, it's especially here and now, a, a thing that I see it even in my daughter's class. But when the teacher shows that she, in, in, in our situation, she means it and she knows what she's doing, I think that even the parents accept it and they see how efficient it is for, the, for their uh, kids. So it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, all we need is the courage from the teachers to change it and to bring something of themselves, of their own, to the classes. So now you mentioned your daughter. Tell us about uh, your daughter and her English a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, I thought that I would try to bring up a, a bilingual child. And when, <laughs> she, when she started to mumble when she was, you know, around one year old, I, I used uh, English rhymes along with the Czech rhymes. And whenever I used English, she just uh, shut my mouth. She didn't want to, she didn't want me to speak to English. listen to it, oh. Because she didn't understand it. But very soon I realized that it's great because she 
distinguished very, very early, she distinguished between the two languages. She knew when I was speaking Czech and she knew when I was speaking English. And I, I realized that when, when she was about three, I realized that she can distinguish English from all the other languages. Czech, of course, but English. She heard somebody on a bus or on a train. She heard somebody speaking a foreign language. She didn't know what the language was, and she would just whisper to me, Mom, but that's not English. Not English. Uh -huh. and, and I realized that it's really cool because she has, since her, her I don't know when it started, but she, had, she has always had this sense of the language or of the languages. And then uh, the first time she had, she, she was exposed to English, like like really exposed, was when I took her on a um, summer holiday with my friends. We went to visit a friend of mine uh, in south of France, but she actually is British. And we stayed with them in France for a few days. And then we uh, went together with them. We went to London to visit them. And we spent almost three weeks with them. And uh, my daughter was for one week, she was silent, the first one week. And then after one week, she did not start with single words, but she started with a sentence. And her first English sentence, she was five. And her first English sentence was, after lunch, she said, Monica, to my friend, she said, Monica, the lunch was yummy. And she- That is the it. best feeling for, the, for a mom, right? Past tense. Who's an English teacher. Oh, for a yes. mom who's an English teacher. Yeah, she, she used past tense without thinking about it. She used correct word order without thinking about it. And she just expressed what she, needed to express without thinking about it. And I think that and that's the whole point for whatever <laughs> we are doing here as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that was actually the starting point for her. And she, since that moment, since that summer, she started to ask me about words that she saw, about sentences that she saw. And she, without having any classes, she started to learn by herself, by asking me, by now by reading, of course, by, by doing lots of other things. But it had to come from her. When I wanted to give it to her, Same. she would not accept it. Same and would, with she, my daughter. She, you know, she just had to somehow grow into it or something. To, uh, yeah, uh, we just need to keep exposing the children uh, or our students, yeah, mm -hmm. if we talk about adult students, to uh, a lot of English. And then at one moment, okay. everything changes yeah. and there is some kind of uh, magic happening. <laughs> and uh, Timing, it's, it's got to be timed well. Yeah. Yes. It would not yeah. work, you know, one year before, when she was four or three, it would not work. And then when she was five, it just clicked and worked. Yeah. Like it was a magic. And the inner motivation, it comes from some need that you want to say something or you need to say something. So I, I see a nice parallel with our adult students here. It's the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same with you guys who are watching, yeah? And that's why the textbooks do not work. Because yeah, they're, exactly. They're artificial and they are not authentic. So uh, yeah. when when the students have to say something to you know their friends sitting next to them, or they need to because you've got lots of native speakers coming and and teaching, uh, coming to teach in your uh, school, it's like yeah, okay, I can't speak Czech. I cannot say it in Czech for the students. So they have to overcome this and say it in English because they need to and and that's really motivating for them when they feel the need to yeah. express something and then it's it just triggers lots of other things as well yeah that's why um I feel like I always want to expose both my daughter and my students to a lot of uh international speakers of English who uh you know they won't understand in Czech so you are even more motivated to communicate 
and right. then when you surround yourself with people like that and situations like that it's much easier to stay motivated right and, and i've got to say that actually living in the 21st century makes it so easy oh, so much easier do you guys remember the 90s we had like one bravichko magazine with one set of lyrics for new kids on the block yeah. And now you just type in the lyrics or you shazam the song and you go to Spotify and whatever. English is everywhere, basically. You go to London to a concert. Yeah, you go to London to a concert. You listen to podcasts. You watch TV. We have Netflix. Ah, all the mobile apps everything yeah. we have yeah. friends here in Brno you can have so many international friends right yeah. so the exposure is really the key I think and to to be able to express something either in writing or in speaking means you need to first you need to get lots of input and and then just get it out of your chest like that's how it works so do you see one of the uh, colleagues who cannot be here tonight but had a question for you about uh, the most recent trends in um, in TEFL in teaching English as a foreign language do you see this happening I know you go abroad you uh, present at conferences about autonomous learning uh, you are finishing your PhD thesis on yeah. autonomous learning in yeah. uh, English English teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, do you see this change happening around the world as well when you talk to your international colleagues? Definitely. I know that I live in a social bubble of fans of autonomy, of learner autonomy. But autonomie, uh, autonomie, když tak česky, to je takový těžký slovo, že jo? <laughs> but I think that it actually, you can now, I know we talked about, we criticized the textbooks, but today even the textbooks have got features of autonomy. And they try to get autonomy there because everybody knows now that that's what works. When the students, when the learners, are responsible and accept the responsibility for their learning yeah carlos um, says autonomy is the key to learning absolutely because without you doing mm -hmm. something for it the teacher cannot just like put yeah. it in your head <laughs> not well, possible it, that that's why i don't like to think of my students as sponge sponges uh because I, I often do this, the, the metaphor of learning and the learners and teaching and the teachers um, in the first week of the semester with my students. And when half of the class or the whole class says, learner is a sponge, I'm like, gosh, that's going to be Hoba. a tough semester. Hoba. It's going to be a tough semester because I've got a classroom full of sponges. They will just sit here passively and wait for me to deliver something on a silver plate and that's not what i do so uh they either stop being sponges or they do well, you you make them you have activities to activate so, them yes they they have tricks how to get around those activities so give, give us one give us one trick how do you stop making students uh uh, be so passive how do you make them more active i believe in visible learning mm -hmm. so one thing that we did today in one of my classes was uh we did conditionals it's given by the syllabus i have to follow the syllables which was designed yeah. by somebody else but i do it differently so what i have for this class i've got this big envelope of uh the structure of the conditional sentences first second third so i've got the words cut it, it, they're printed quite large and they are cut into individual words in different colors and uh, the students just get an envelope and they have to put the structure of the three conditionals together themselves somehow they usually know how to do the first conditional and then they struggle with um the wood. which is what give me an example of a first conditional uh, i always give them an, an example um 
if you learn hard, you will pass the test, you will pass the exam. And then when they sit at the exam and they are thinking, oh my God, if I worked hard, I would pass the test now, but I didn't, for God's sake. And then when they fail, they can say, if I had worked hard, I would have passed. passed the test. And when they see it, uh, when they see the structure of these sentences in those colors on the desk or on the floor, it's quite big. Uh, so they have to really move, they have to cooperate together in groups. Um, they end up with a template for conditionals. And the fact that, that I make them move, that they see the colors, that they do something different, makes them, I hope, makes them remember uh, the conditionals in a better way, more efficiently. Of course, I've got the slides there and I share the slides with them after the class in an email and stuff, but it's too traditional. It's nice but to what I hear, it's also the cooperation. Yeah, it's exactly. not just the visual part, but it's the cooperation. It's trying to figure it out. I love when this happens in class. I always say you learn the best by trying to explain it to somebody else, yeah, by teaching it. So it's the trying to figure it out together, the teamwork. Meta, meta language, yes, that they have to use. And I don't mind if they do it in Czech. Partly. I, I usually, my favorite sentence, my students laugh at me, is English, por favor. That's what I say in every class when I hear them speaking Czech or Slovak. Yeah. But when we, when we work on grammar, on something as complex as conditionals, I let them speak Czech. And the yeah, fact same. That explain it to one another. I, I just love it. I hate silent class. Yeah. I, I just, I feel like a silent class is the work is not happening, the learning is not happening. So I love when they talk, when they help one another, when they do something. And and today I saw how they were trying, how they were, you know, asking other people. And there were 11 students in the group today, at, apart from one who had uh, crutches and a, a twisted knee or something, could not walk. Everybody else walked around and talked to people and they were taking pictures with their mobile phones and they were taking notes in their books. And I was like, wow, this is it. This is this the learning. Visible learning that they can, I see it, and they are bringing something home today with them that they hopefully somehow got into their brains as well. And it's it's visible. That's that's really important as well. So I'm, I was not serving it on a silver plate, even though I know how to do silver service. I don't do it. <laughs> it's, it's much more fun and it's much more efficient when they do it themselves. So yeah, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm a tough teacher. And my students, now is the end of the semester, so it's okay. Your students are okay with it because that's what they expect when they come to your classes. Yeah. But imagine somebody who is yeah. used to a mainstream secondary school teaching from or learning from the textbooks. Now, then, now they have to speak to each other about it. Yeah. Now, well, they come to university and, you know, Luvikova is there and telling them, ha, 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 we're going to do it differently. It must be a real shock. And they're not but, prepared for it. But as it. you know, as you know, and I know as well, they love it. You are a very popular teacher yeah. among university students. Uh, anybody here watching who uh, Lenka taught, please send <laughs> send a comment. She would be so happy for sure. And often we get students here who are now adults who sure. used to have Lenka as a teacher at mm -hmm. university. And those are the most beautiful moments because they can just continue with uh, what you started at university with your program yeah. English autonomously. And this is when we met, yeah, and we started sharing uh, bits and pieces of our projects and we realized, wow, it's it's based on the same values, the same tool, very similar tools, very similar uh, processes and language language goal setting. All of this, yes, language coaching, um, all of this works. So, what's your what's your favorite style when when you look at this innovative um, 
uh, innovative innovative methods. Yeah, <laughs> what's your favorite style to get everything out of the students with just giving them prompts and then putting pieces, bits and pieces together as a puzzle and something beautiful comes out of it at the end, like our cooking lessons, for example. Uh, this can be done with anything, right? But what I love the most is personalized learning. It's even more, it's, it's even stronger, I believe, than individualized learning. I understand it. I understand the difference uh, between the two in a way that individualized means that I'm the teacher and I've got, you know, I don't know, seven students and this one needs this, I'm going to give him this and this one needs that, so I'm going to give him that. But it all comes from the teacher. When, yeah. uh, whereas personalized means that it's tailored to the student and the student does it themselves. They, they choose, they, they basically choose, choose it themselves. So they, they actually have to put lots of much more effort into effort. the life. You have to bring a lot to make it work. It's not up to the teacher. The teacher is there. And the teacher has to be there as the guide, as the one who asks the right questions, who unveils the blind spots and everything else. Because I, I think, you know, given my age and everything, I do have more experience than the learners. I've had so many students and learners in my hands, in my classes. So I know what they face. And, you know, I've, I've been a learner myself. So I know what to expect and how to maybe prevent some things or how, on the other hand, actually expose my students to situations when they realize, oh, aha, or, or something. So uh, the, the role of the teacher is really crucial in, in yeah. the whole process. It's not like you can do it all on your own. You can, but then you, you really have to be determined. Um, so, so the teacher is important, but the learner is much more important. Much more important, yeah. yeah. So you basically just described perfectly what we do here and why some of our students struggle with it because True. it is a lot of responsibility and people, yeah. they say they are ready for it, but when they realize how much responsibility it is, uh, they some of course uh, life happens and uh, kids are sick or you change uh, mm -hmm. your job or something, but mm -hmm. in the end it's again just you and you, yeah, and um, and it's, it's just how and much effort you put into yeah. it. But you can, it's good to know where to get the right help, yeah, which tools to use uh which strategies which techniques to use and there are so many good ones oh we have nadia hi nadia oh my god hi nadia Travničková. you remember her she was at our weekend okay yes I'm uh, from ostrava yes hi nadia so nice to see you here so if you have any questions ladies and gentlemen uh for lenka please type them in here uh, Nadia says, yes, I have to agree. Lenka is a great teacher and I really like the lessons with her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. <laughs> so uh, Nadia did uh, the cooking. Cooking. Uh, we were, had our Sunday, uh, Sunday uh, program here, uh, which included cooking uh, lunch. Lenka, despite the fact she's not uh, a chef or a, a native speaker. I have tried so many different teachers for cooking lessons because uh, many of you probably know I do a lot of uh, experiential lessons here, a lot of cooking lessons. Uh, Lenka is the best, seriously. It has nothing to do with if you can cook. Uh, of, of course, she can cook, but um, <laughs> But I, if, but you're a, if you're a chef or if uh, if you're a native speaker, it's all about how you can manage the people, your sous chefs, in this kitchen behind me. Yes, and, and uh, so yeah, is is the student. So it's the same. It's a good analogy actually to the learning. I'm there to help. I'm I'm there if they have questions, but I'm not the one who is going to slice things and and cook the stuff. Oh, we've got something, Susanna Morha. Where can I get some practical tips? Do you have a website or a bank of activities? 
<laughs> yes, so a fellow teacher. Hello, Susanna, fellow teacher, yes. <laughs> Do you have something like that, Lenny? Um, actually, we are now putting together a new website of the course I, I designed or I, I uh, started, kicked off at Masaryk University. Uh, the course name is English Autonomously and parts, so if you type in muni.cz English Autonomously, you're going to get to the website of our course. Uh, it's not updated, but we are working on it. And uh, there is a section with tips for reading and writing and speaking activities and listening and practicing grammar and everything else. So you can definitely go there and use some of those sources. Some of them are actually from uh, University of Helsinki Language Center, which also has got a very good bank of resources. Uh, but a small warning, this is aimed at uh, university students. So it's it's not for younger learners. I think it's adults are OK. Um, people, I don't know, in their late teenage years, maybe in their <laughs> 20s and older will benefit from these, definitely. So yes, th th this is where we can get something, you can get something. We should help our students. And also, uh, also, uh, I have something on my blog uh, about uh, uh, grammar uh, that we did together. Yeah, the, the workshop, how to learn grammar without course books. We did a workshop together with Lenka. Lenka brought a lot of really cool ideas and then I put it into a blog post and that's a really nice one. People really enjoyed the activities that that are in, included there. If you want to see something uh, something on uh, my website, my blog, yeah, because we work on a lot of things together. So this is Carlos just commenting. It's really cool because that's actually what yeah. my dissertation is about. Uh, I do believe in autonomy. I'm a big fan of autonomy. And uh, metacognition is definitely a big part of it. I've concentrated on the language learning strategies and the metacognition and how uh, they develop when we support students' autonomy, when we give them the responsibility, what happens uh, with their cognition and metacognition. That's what really matters and what I'm interested in. Um, and how I'm going to finish it successfully. <laughs> Hey. You will, you will. Lenka is almost done with her PhD thesis. So, wow. <laughs> oh, cool. um, here is here is a, a question actually from Carlos about uh, correcting mistakes. That's always um, a favorite. <laughs> so, how do you do it? I often actually make a list of the mistakes my students make, and I write them down and they know that I'm writing something so very often they comment on it oh she's writing something I made a mistake and they when they see me and when they learn the trick they're like they start to correct themselves and that's amazing that's the best thing that can happen because I believe that once you start to realize you make mistakes and once you start correcting your own mistakes you're on on a way to actually avoid them and not to make them in the future and I always say this to my students. So um, I usually make a list of the mistakes my students make and then write them on the whiteboard and they correct them. That yes. happens in almost every class. But I have to say that there are some mistakes that I feel like I have to correct this immediately. It's, it's a mistake that everybody can learn from when I do it right now. So sometimes, I just do it immediately and I I always tell my students in the beginning of the semester in the beginning of the time we spend together I always tell them I'm not doing this to in, um, to humiliate you or, or to intimidate you I I correct your mistakes because other people can learn from those mistakes and you can learn from it and I think it's really important for them to know this to to yeah, to feel the security that that's really. We could do 
One day, uh, Lenny, I think uh, we could do a whole webinar on mistakes and how mistakes yeah. are our friend. Chyba uh, kamarátka, you know that famous poster? Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, that's a big thing, especially in Czech society where, um, yeah, you are really not allowed to make mistakes. But I know this is not the only culture dealing with it. So um, that's basically yeah, right. happening sure. everywhere. Uh, I just uh, wanted to um, highlight this comment from Nadia uh, that uh, cooking was great but even better she corrected herself later even better was the other lesson about learning new words yeah Lenka um, does a lot of uh, magic here because I believe in vocabulary I I I know that as a teacher I should not say that but <laughs> grammar is not as important as vocabulary I, I think I I had a grandfather and we all loved him so much. He was an amazing person. He knew no grammar in German and he just knew the words. And he actually negotiated the business in the 1920s and 1930s in, in Vienna, in Austria easily, even without grammar. Um, I, and, and ever since he knew just a few words and he had those skills and Ever since this, I believe that the words are what matters. So you need lots of vocabulary and the grammar will just come along. And you, um, when you know the grammar, but you don't have the words, then you're not going to express anything. If you know the words and you've got a lack of grammar, you're going to sound like an idiot for some time, but you're able to express what you want to express and people will understand you. And then the yeah. grammar is going to grow into it and you'll be okay. So so grammar somehow comes naturally. Of course, it's great to have a teacher to help you, to have somebody who corrects you, who directs you. But I think that the words are the key. That's that's really crucial. So I, I always um, make my students make lists of vocabulary, drill vocabulary in different ways. I try to show them different ways how to learn because um, everybody has to find their own way of learning, the best way, the yeah. best way for themselves. It's not their like own personalized way. Exactly. And you are here to help them. Yeah, you are the Please. coach who asks the right questions or a mentor rather. Yeah, mm -hmm. who asks the uh, questions or facilitator. Yeah, Carlos also mentioned he's trying to work on his facilitating skills. That's uh, not so easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are courses to take. Mm -hmm. um, wh where have you learned all this? That would be my final question. How did you, Lenny, come to all of this? I don't know. That's something that I think. <laughs> My mom said that we somehow have it in our genes, that you know it, it runs in our blood, that the teaching blood, we do have it because everybody in my family is a teacher. So it somehow comes naturally. Uh, and then I just notice things and I notice I know how I learned, I notice how other people learn, and then I just I, I because I've I've always been interested in, in the process of learning, I think that I notice things that other people do not see and then I can use them for the benefit of other people and that's how I've, I've actually developed this skill and then two months ago I took a course in neuro language coaching and it just confirmed a lot of what I knew even before. Um, Even without a course, you yeah, knew it instinctively, in, intuitively. I just do it intuitively very much. So I, I think that, yeah, it's somebody, it was it was at a conference somewhere when somebody spoke about uh, pedagogical care, caring. And I think that I do have this and I'm, I'm interested in the growth of my students and I care about them and I want them to learn as much as they can for themselves. And because I want to do this, I have to have all the instruments and tools to offer to them 
for them to choose from. I, I'm not gonna choose for them. I always give them a portfolio of ideas or, or you know, several tips. And they are the ones who make the choice. But if they are lost, I will give them hopefully the inspiration or some tips. So, yeah. And that's one thing I, I think that's the most important thing why I love working with you. Uh, apart from being friends with you, that you uh, always keep growing. You never stop learning. And I think that people around you can feel it. And it's very attractive yeah for for uh just a regular person uh in our uh, case uh ladies yeah who yeah. need this support who need uh this um caring approach just like university students who sometimes feel lost yeah, yeah? and you are a little bit like their mom uh in the best uh, uh possible way so mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. Thank you for caring for our thank students you. here and uh, doing it for so many years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they sometimes people ask me, how can you do it for so many years? And it's just when you love it, you there's no. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's the best. When, when this happens, it's the best solution, the, the, the best way. Yeah. So uh, I would say the same about Lenka, když jí miluješ, není co řešit. Uh, so, uh, so uh, ladies, if you want to uh, experience uh, what Lenka does in our courses, you are most welcome. Uh, where do you, Lenny, uh, teach? In which courses? If the ladies are interested, you are watching now. Advanced. I usually teach the advanced courses uh, with yes. you. Uh, so Which are usually on Mondays, yeah? Pokročili are on Mondays. Mm -hmm. And then I do the weekends, which are amazing because yes. they're yes. really, very really different um, and, and intense as well. And for me, I love you know that the, the weekends are the, the kick or the trigger that you need to to learn to start doing something or the workshops we had last week we had a workshop yes. we did yes. oh, 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 i have to show you we prepared we wanted to show you lenka she's so versatile she has so many talents so last week she did a workshop uh for uh, advent wreaths yes and uh, we were all making these beautiful advent christmas wreaths so you do a lot of different things <laughs> I like to do a lot of different things. Yes, true. Yes. Um, yeah. What else do I do? I did once. We did music. We did a. Uh, it was music and movies. Cards. Oh, that was great! Cards. I loved it. Yes. Yes. And yes. We yes. Skills in the past. So if if we have enough students who are interested, we could again do soft skills. I'm sure because that's that was, that was in, great. Yeah interested in you do but, lots of presentation skills lessons apart from yeah. all the other lessons you also do presentation skills yeah. so mm -hmm. that's an interesting one you do the, you like the pecha kucha concept yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's I like, like with that yeah. that's a killer yeah. it's cool it's a it's, killer it's, <laughs> it is it's, it's it is we like to push our students to the limit yeah because then that's that's when the magic happens, when you step out of your comfort zone, you yeah, go on Facebook Live like you did today. Look, exactly. you did one hour, eight minutes already, and it you look like, like it does not feel like over. Yep. Yeah. You look fine. <laughs> yeah. So, right. so Lenny, you survived it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry, I'm usually used to <laughs> addressing uh our students of ladies but we had carlos here as well and i suppose yes. other uh, gentlemen hopefully as well uh if you have any more questions uh, you can post them here in the comments below the video lenka will answer anything uh carlos had a few other questions so len you can go either tonight or tomorrow or when you find uh find time lenka is a very busy teacher who is also finishing her phd uh PhD okay. thesis to her. Uh, yes this is peer pressure yeah now we shared it with lots of people yeah. this is one of the tips that we always have for our students if you want to um get something done 
share it with a lot of people and they they pressure you <laughs> right okay it was a taboo it's, it was a taboo question up until now how is your phd going and now it has gone public so i can accept lots of people asking great it's like why are you still single <laughs> it's one of those questions yeah it's like you don't want to answer that still right okay so we have katya we have katya greifenegawa uh, thanks girls it was awesome have a nice evening uh nadia Thank you for this. Uh, Zuzana well, also said thank you for your answer. So I, I, I would say this was a success, Lenny. And thank you. Thank you for making I, me stepping out of my comfort zone. <laughs> that's what I do. You know, that's what I do. <laughs> so um, have a have a nice rest of of your evening and. Um, We'll see you in another interview or in one of our courses, hopefully, those of you who are here. And happy Advent to everybody. Yes, yes, happy Advent to everybody. Absolutely. So, ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us.